I'm David Patrick, CISA's Chief Acquisition Executive, and welcome to our Industry Day focused on CISA's important infrastructure security mission. Uh, as you heard in the video, uh, it said we do not tape, but beforehand we do tape. Uh, so what I want to say is we received numerous requests to record our Industry Days and are pleased to announce that we heard those requests and worked out the technical and legal details so that this live event today can be recorded. And as was mentioned, an edited version will be provided and posted on CISA's YouTube channel in the near future. Unfortunately, we are not able to record the breakout sessions and associated uh, events with this. So please make sure to attend those as we will not be able to provide those uh, available events in the future. Uh, CISA looks forward to our industry days and, and we focus on uh, the capabilities that our organizations will need in the future. We do not focus on specific current contracting actions. We try to understand better what CISA is doing and pre present that to you so that you can have a well awareness of our diverse missions and provide a look ahead for our potential future capability needs. These type of events provide information that help you plan and determine what to develop the business you seek to compete for in the future, and we hope it results in better products and services for us in the near future. In my many meetings with industry, there seems to be some common misunderstandings about what CISA does and does not do as part of its various missions, so we hope to do a little myth busting this week. We hope it helps you better understand what we do and help secure our nation's critical infrastructure in the process. We will make it easier for you to help us secure the future. In today's live event, you will hear from senior members of the Infrastructure Security Division, including Deputy As Executive Associate Director Steve Harris. By the way, Steve, uh, I have to say, has my favorite job title acronym, The Dead. It seems like it should be a wrestler or a comic book hero or, or a character, which uh, honestly, I guess is probably appropriate since his team is kind of superheroes when it comes to securing our nation's critical infrastructure. Anyway, uh, the IST team will provide information about their mission, the capabilities they have and look to build upon in the future. In our follow on breakout sessions throughout the week, subject matter experts and requirements owners will participate in more in depth discussions and Q&A. And I really encourage you to participate in those breakout sessions as they allow for direct interaction with the people who know the most about our infrastructure mission. In addition to today's industry events and our other industry engagements and breakout sessions that you may attend, you've probably heard about our vendor engagement program and how much more engagement we here at CISA are doing with industry. You can reach out to our vendor engagement program and ask to provide capability briefings and product demonstrations to representatives from CISA's various divisions and offices. While these are not tied to or intended to lead to any specific contracting opportunities, the industry capability briefings and demonstrations allow you to showcase your products and services to the requirements owners and SMEs of CISA. While it also helps us gain a better understanding and awareness of the marketplace and supports our SMEs in developing potential requirements for their future contracting activities. These briefing opportunities are very popular. We get lots and lots of requests for them. We have greatly increased the number of the engagements to give you an opportunity to give many of you and more of you an opportunity uh, to tell us about the great capabilities you have to offer. Of course, the number of these requests still exceed the number we can accommodate. So if you reach out to us, you will hear back from us quickly, usually asking for more information. And uh, if you are selected for one of our uh, events to be able to present your capabilities, because of the volume of those requests, those meetings tend to be scheduled out now several months in advance. As always, and as was mentioned in the video, I encourage you to, to visit Doing Business with CISA on CISA.gov for upcoming events, links, and information. Also, please visit SAM.gov for our current contracting opportunities and reach out to the POC listed should you have any questions. And you can also visit the Acquisition Planning Forecast System uh, to view potential future contracting opportunities. And if you have any APFS inquiries that are specific to CISA, please send those to APFS-inquiries at CISA.DHS.gov and we will post that link to the, uh, to the chat uh, shortly. And finally, I want to take this opportunity to thank our presenters, the team who coordinated this week's event, and for all of you for attending. Now, please join me in welcoming ISD Deputy Executive Associate Director, 
Steve Harris to the virtual stage. David, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you to you and your team for uh, the partnership in setting up the uh, Infrastructure Security Division Industry Day. To those of you that are joining us virtually, thank you for taking the time to learn more about the Infrastructure Security Mission and our division. We very much look forward to uh, opportunities uh, for future partnerships. Uh, the Infrastructure Security Division leads the coordinated effort to reduce risk posed to a critical infrastructure. CISA's strategy and mission requirements are happening during an era of profound change in threat and risk, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. These shifts are, actually, are reflected in our priorities for, infra for the infrastructure security mission, and I want to walk through uh, those uh, very quickly here. Terrorism and targeted violence, heightened nation state threats to critical infrastructure and national security, as well as catastrophic natural threats and climate change. For priority one within the security mission, uh, our first priority is responding to the threat of terrorism and targeted violence. Recent reports such as the um, uh, Office of the uh, Director of National Intelligence 2023 Annual Threat Assessment Report highlight how real this threat uh, of terrorism and targeted violence is. The US uh, Secret Service National Threat Assessment Center's Mass Attacks in Public Spaces 26 through 2016 through 2020 identified 173 incidents in which three or more people, not including the perpetrator, were harmed during an attack in a public or semi-public space in the US. Improvised explosive devices, IEDs, are an enduring and global threat and are a common tactic in terrorism and targeted violence. Bombing activity in the US, including the Nashville bombing and other related incidents, are increasing as a part of broader threats. And you'll hear more about this today as well. Priority two is the heightened nation state threat to critical infrastructure. Our present national security environment is defined by global competition among near peer rival nations who have demonstrated US critical infrastructure remains an attractive target. The 2022 National Security Strategy, as well as the 2022 National Defense Strategy, emphasize the need for, uh, for anticipating and defending the nation state against attacks against our critical infrastructure. For CISA and DHS, this means an increased emphasis on joint civil military co cooperation and coordination, on identifying critical infrastructure, assessing vulnerabilities, and developing security solutions that strengthen the backbone of American life. In ISD, we're focused on building robust tools that will support that work. Harmonizing defense and, and homeland security planning and operations is challenging work, and this is uh, what we consider to be a growth area for ISD in coming years. Priority three, infrastructure resilience to catastrophic natural hazards and climate change. This is an area to better understand this challenge where we are providing voluntary assessments of specific critical infra infrastructure that identifies a range of security and resilience issues that we that could have regional or national significant consequences, and then using this information to be able to make the best decisions. We are intent on aligning our work uh, to these priorities, ensuring that we have a close connection between our work with all of you and the national security of the, of the United States. These priorities align to our key statutory imperatives identifying prioritizing critical infrastructure, developing mitigations for security vulnerabilities, assessing and analyzing critical infrastructure, sharing information and intelligence, and coordination with government and industry. Next slide, please. The Infrastructure Security Division, where I serve as the deputy, has a specific responsibility for the security and resilience of the nation's critical infrastructure. We're organized around seven subdivisions, which we will discuss in greater detail later in the presentation today. We have four core capabilities that we uh, bear to drive the achievement of ISD's mission and the nation's security and resilience goals. That is assessments and analysis, security resilience and operations, exercise, I'm sorry, expertise and guidance, and capacity building. Next slide, please. The infrastructure security risk environment, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we're operating in an era of profound change in threat and risk. Unconventional threats, including strategic competition with near peer adversary nations, 
uh, intelligence collections, foreign, mal, uh, foreign influence, and increase, increasingly dominate national security concerns. Terrorism and targeted violence, persistent cyber threats, expanding exposures to natural hazards and climate risks, and a host of emerging techniques and tactics are driving the way that are driving necessary changes to the way we must work together to solve security challenges. We are intent with working with industry to focus on this, this shift towards confronting often unfamiliar and new threats as they emerge. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Daniel Breu from the Security, uh, Security Program Subdivision. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be on the call today. Uh, as Mr. Harris mentioned, my name is Daniel Abreu and I am with the Office of Security Programs. I had the opportunity to participate in this event last year, uh, so hopefully many of you had a chance to, to hear from me and, and some of my colleagues then as well. Uh, but I'm going to go over some of the uh, who we are and what we do type of information for security programs uh, quite in a bit of a lightning speed uh, to be respectful of your time and those of my other colleagues who will be speaking, uh, but I'm always uh, available offline uh, to answer any questions as necessary. Um, all right, so going right into it, uh, the first slide that you see here, threats and incidents, uh, it's important to us for a couple reasons. One, uh, it highlights sort of the evolution and the type of incidents that have happened in the homeland uh, just in the last five years. But within security programs specifically, uh, what matters to us is that it helped establish uh, who we are and what we do, uh, specifically those incidents in 2018, Parkland and in Pittsburgh. Uh, that is when the Office of Security Programs was first established as a task force and then subsequently formalized in 2019. Uh, security Programs focuses uh, primarily on public gathering security and federal facility security. Uh, with emphasis on domestic violent extremism and targeted violence, uh, some of those areas that Mr. Harris uh, talked about. But those capabilities that we make available are applicable across all sectors. And ultimately, our goal is to build stakeholder security capacity uh, through training and resources to reduce risk. Uh, next slide, please. So simply saying that we do public gathering security and federal facility security and then putting an umbrella of DVE and TV is just too broad. Uh, you can do almost anything within that portfolio. So these documents, uh, what we call our foundational documents, just provide some parameters uh, for how we refine our priorities. Uh, so whether they're the internal documents like the CISA strategic plan or some of the external facing documents like executive orders, uh, they really help us uh, focus in on what is of uh, most critical need. And then, of course, as Mr. Harris mentioned, uh, we have the ISD priorities and core capabilities to help frame it as well. And uh, critically important, uh, if not most important, uh, the needs of our stakeholders. Next slide, please. So this is what security programs looks like. Uh, we have four branches with a wide range of uh, portfolios. Uh, those that focus specifically on uh, threat areas such as active shooter, vehicle ramming and the like. Uh, as well as broader security planning uh, type of areas that I'll talk about later, and then uh, honing in more specifically on the type of facility, such as federal facility security. I'm going to talk about just a few of these uh, in terms of our portfolios, but as Monique mentioned, tomorrow there's a breakout session, and just as a cheap plug, strongly recommend if you have an opportunity to participate in the one that my colleague uh, Susan Schneider is going to be providing, which will go into greater detail on two of our portfolios, active shooter preparedness and what we call non-confrontational techniques. Next slide, please. All right, so active shooter preparedness. This is a flagship program uh, for security programs, and I, I would argue uh, to some capacity uh, and some extent uh, CISA-wide. It's a very highly requested set of capabilities uh, by our stakeholders, public and private. The emphasis uh, is placed on the effective development of emergency action plans for organizations, of course, but we also have uh, resources and training that focus on individual actions that can be taken before and during an incident and also following. So uh, the traditional run, hide, fight, but also some other uh, capabilities that, that we convey as well. Uh, we have resources in this capability in uh, 17 different languages. And we did that intentionally to make sure that we can reach into the uh, most amount of communities uh, within uh, the United States as possible. And we've also had some international stakeholders through the State Department and others who have actually uh, adopted some of our capabilities. 
we've also had uh, Fortune 500 companies use our uh, capabilities almost one for one in their international uh, training programs as well. So in this portfolio, we have international, I'm sorry, uh, in-person and virtual instructor-led uh, training, and then we also have a, a pretty prominent online presence. And just to give you an idea on the reach uh, for this program, since 2020, when COVID began, uh, we've trained more than 65,000 people uh, who are responsible for their organization's emergency action plan development. In the next couple months or so, we're hoping that we can get out um, from underneath the, the webinars and be a little bit more active in the in-person engagements. And when we do that, uh, we have a really exciting virtual reality capability that we're going to be launching uh, to further help our stakeholders think through uh, doing workshops. What are some of the actions that they ultimately would um, would recommend or request their uh, respective employees to take during an incident? So they'll have an opportunity to actually immerse themselves in a simulated attack. Next slide, please. So vehicle ramming mitigation is also another important set of capabilities, uh, one that our stakeholders request quite a bit. Uh, what we focus on here is supporting stakeholders in assessing potential vulnerabilities, uh, but also providing tangible recommendations through resources and tools. An example of, of a tool that we put together is a self-assessment uh, tool that we uh, developed in partnership with the Chicago Police Department. And that's a very intuitive, user-friendly tool that you can put, uh, put in very simple information and it generates uh, recommended actions and uh, resources that can help inform uh, enhanced security measures that you would apply leading up to a special event. But aside from developing uh, the products and resources that are external facing, uh, we've also been involved in some of the more strategic areas uh, within the department. And that includes a couple years ago when we developed a congressional report uh, that was required by law that, that assessed department-wide capabilities and recommended further actions uh, to mitigate risk. Next slide, please. So the non-confrontational techniques, these are relatively uh, unique resources for us in that in these resources, we're not talking about guns, guards, and gates. We're not talking about hardening facilities. We're talking about the softer security skills. And we're emphasizing the utilization of de-escalation techniques to thwart an attack before it happens. So when an, a potential suspicious behavior is identified, what are the actions that, you, that one can take uh, to be able to sort of mitigate that before it materializes? And the other unique aspect of these set of resources is that we focus on not just security professionals, but they can be implemented and utilized by non-security staff. So organizations are able to augment inherently uh, their security through uh, additional non-security personnel. Next slide, please. The insider threat mitigation uh, portfolio focuses on all aspects of what you would think is in the insider threat consideration uh, and including cyber and physical. And we have everything here, as you see under current capabilities um, from comprehensive step by step guidance, where we walk from A to Z on how to develop an effective uh, insider threat program for an organization to tailored quick hit one to two page products, um, whether it's for human capital resource uh, officers or or uh, or others that can focus uh, more on sort of specific parts of uh, the program itself. And within all these resources, we emphasize threat management teams to encourage organizations to utilize the, the majority of their organizations and different disciplines uh, to help enhance what their insider threat mitigation program looks like. We partnered a couple of years ago with Carnegie Mellon to develop a self-assessment tool uh, that really helps organizations go through the process of assessing if they have an insider threat program, how effective it is, and then how to enhance it uh, with very specific recommendations. Next slide, please. So the safety and security planning is that portfolio is as vague as the terminology uh, sounds. We have uh, very general threat neutral resources that emphasize preparedness, but within it, we also have uh, topic du jour resources such as uh, the electricity substation, uh, which is very topical these days, as well as uh, back when the COVID-19 vaccine was first being developed, uh, developing resource documents to secure it from uh, where it's uh, developed to where it's ultimately ends uh, for dissemination. 
we also have a guide uh, to help security professionals think through how to effectively communicate to their C-suite members, uh, how to uh, request additional uh, investment for security uh, based on uh, tangible impacts to organizations financially, because as we all know, for the C-suite, that's what resonates is the bottom line. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have a, a suite of innovative tools that are currently under development, as you see there under the development uh, tab, uh, including an augmented reality uh, to support special event uh, planning, uh, security planning leading up to special events. So we're really excited that we're not just doing printed materials, we're thinking outside the box and helping people really sort of visualize uh, what security looks like, how it can be enhanced in a cost effective manner. Next slide, please. So UAS is an increasing focus area for us uh, based on interagency and stakeholder concerns and, and interest. And uh, similar to insider threat, uh, for the UAS, we focus on all aspects of UAS, so everything from cyber to kinetic threats. And the resources that we develop really focus on helping people navigate through uh, the legal parameters on how to mitigate uh, this threat from an external focus, uh, because there are uh, quite significant laws that prohibit certain actions uh, for organizations to take uh, if they if they do it, uh, come across this threat. And in how to safely integrate uh, the technology internally uh, without introduce, introducing unintentional consequences. So from both perspectives, internal and external. Um, and then we also provide direct advice and support to stakeholders uh, leading up to special events and supporting flight restriction requests to the FAA. Uh, and then finally, we're very entrenched in helping uh, with policy and strategic efforts, including helping enhance existing authorities uh, with the lens of critical infrastructure and, and how we can better position uh, the community to more effectively mitigate uh, this evolving threat. Next slide, please. All right, this is this is my last slide. Um, so as some of you hopefully know, CISA serves as the chair for the Interagency Security Committee. Uh, collectively with nearly 70 departments and agencies, uh, we collaborate to develop best practices, standards, uh, and other resources to help inform federal facility security. And a lot of the, the products, the great thing about these products is that they are developed uh, in concert with many other departments and agencies, uh, but they're not just applicable to the federal government. There, there are really some great information there that can be applied to the private sector as well. Uh, and then we have a, a range of uh, resources from the foundational standards, uh, which is the risk management process and its uh, corresponding countermeasures documents, uh, to threat specific resources such as UAS that's specific to the federal government. Um, this particular mission was established in 1995 by executive order, so it's uh, that executive order itself is quite a bit dated. Um, so we're actually working through the process of getting it updated so that it could be more reflective on the evolution of the mission and the threat environment itself. So I mentioned I was going to try to be as fast as I can. I will pause here and introduce uh, Kelly Murray, uh, who will discuss chemical security. Over to you, ma'am. Thanks so much. Uh, hi all, I'm Kelly Murray, Associate Director for Chemical Security here at CISA. And uh, chemicals are vital to the national economy, really to the global economy. They are in literally everything from the toothpaste and the makeup I use this morning to the computer I've been using all day to the wine I'm going to drink after work tonight. Uh, so it's critical to use those chemicals in, in our economy, but it's also critical to protect those chemicals in our economy. In the wrong hands, chemicals can and have been used and, and weaponized in a, in a very significant fashion. Uh, that can happen through the theft of those chemicals or diversion of those chemicals and then used at uh, a, a public event, as, as Daniel was talking about. That can also be used at the facility itself. And so within chemical security, our mission is to protect against those incidents, those attacks. We do that through a variety of different ways. Next slide. So first, this is uh, my organization. It is not as uh, fancy as Daniel's was, uh, but essentially we work uh, with a variety of folks and specialists across my organization, from those chemical engineers and chemists to our physical security and cybersecurity professionals, to training specialists, uh, IT specialists, a variety of different folks that come together to, to make this uh, mission executable. Next slide. 
So uh, I'll spend the majority of time here on this slide and just talk about the, the primary avenues that, that we protect here in chemical security. So our first and primary goal is to strengthen the nation uh, protection against those chemical attacks. And we do that primarily through the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards Regulation or the CFATS regulation. CFATS is a very nuanced uh, kind of novel regulation that's been around for just about 16 years now. It is a performance-based and risk-based regulation, which is a little bit different, but in my opinion, the, the right way to regulate critical infrastructure partners in that we work very closely with those partners in order to make sure that we are helping them to identify those cost-effective measures that meet the physical and cybersecurity requirements that we put on them. And this is done then through this partnership model of a regulation, which again is kind of a, a novel approach. We currently regulate about 3,300 facilities across the country, uh, all within uh, the nation. And those companies vary, again, from the primary chemical manufacturers and distributors, from food manufacturers and wineries and breweries, hospitals, education systems, a, a wide variety of different companies that are actually regulated by this program. And we work very closely with them to help them then implement these different different physical and, and cybersecurity standards. After 16 years of developing the CFATS program, we realized that we have a lot of lessons learned that could be applied further than the 3,300 facilities. So we developed back in November of 2021, our Chemlock Voluntary Chemical Security Program. So this program is more broadly uh, utilized on a voluntary basis, but is really developed based on our best practices from the CFATS regulation. As I said, about 3,300 facilities are regulated by the department by CISA. We have more than 40,000 facilities that have submitted their chemical inventories to us. And we have even more facilities that have dangerous chemicals in just smaller quantities or concentrations or specifically exempt from the regulation. So the Chemlock program was built in order to take all of those great physical and cybersecurity best practices and provide new resources on a voluntary basis to this larger community. We have a, a, a group of different tools and services that, that we've started piloting since November of 2021. Uh, we're offering chemical security training, both a basic and advanced training. We're offering exercises that uh, are off the shelf exercises, as well as in person exercises that can be conducted. On site assessments and assistance that can actually host at a facility walk around that company and help them to identify the best practices for their physical and cybersecurity posture. And then resources and resources and resources. So a variety of different flyers, fact sheets, security planning guides and templates that these different companies can utilize in order to enhance their uh, security on a voluntary basis. So something we're really excited that takes the CFATS goal and, and really amplifies it even more. Uh, through our Chemlock program. Our third goal is specific to ammonium nitrate, and it is a point of sale regulation that we are in the process of standing up. We received the statutory authority for a point of sale regulation, and we are getting close uh, to trying to publish a supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking. It's currently listed on the unified agenda of September of 2023 for publishing. And this is a, a very nuanced, very specific and targeted regulation that again, affects the sale and transfer of ammonium nitrate only. And the last one is all about outreach. Uh, as I said, we're a different kind of regulatory authority and now we're working in that voluntary space as well. And so we really leverage our partnerships with our stakeholders, both in industry as well as in the federal, state and local government to help us get the word out about chemical security, help us enhance and identify those best practices and work together to solve that, that chemical security issue nationwide. And really, work globally as well. We are the co-implementers of the Global Congress on Chemical Security and Emerging Threats as well. And this is an opportunity for us to learn from other countries and to share what we've learned with those countries, again, to really enforce and, and globally impact chemical security. 
And that is all I have for today. I will turn it over to uh, an amazing mission space of School Safety Task Force and Lindsay Burton. Lindsay, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Kelly, and good afternoon, everyone. As Kelly mentioned, my name is Lindsay Burton, and I am the Acting Associate Director for CISA School Safety Task Force. I'm really excited to be here today to share information about our program. So as you can see on the slide, um, it includes an overview of our mission and aligned focus areas. So CISA established the School Safety Task Force to support the federal government's efforts in strengthening the safety and security of K-12 schools across the country. We support schools by developing actionable and tailorable resources, educating the 12, uh, K-12 communities on school safety issues, threats, and hazards that they may face, and by equipping communities with the knowledge and resources they need to strengthen school safety. And, and within that includes uh, designing school safety resources and guidance with a particular emphasis on building the capacity of K-12 schools and districts to protect against and mitigate security threats and risks. Uh, conducting outreach to the academic community to build awareness and promote vigilance, and then coordinating federal efforts with other departments and agencies that have equities to this space. I think it's important to understand and recognize that schools really do have unique needs, challenges, and considerations when it comes to safety and security. These circumstances really require us to look at school safety differently than maybe some other public spaces. It also drives the need for a really holistic approach to the issue. Next slide. Um, so this slide reflects our current organizational structure, not as fancy as well as security programs earlier uh, in the presentation, but really you'll see we're organized across four primary branches. So our communications team, really important to our efforts, and they focus on outreach, education, and strategic communication with the program's key stakeholders. This includes development of regular communications campaigns centered around timely and critical school safety topics. We also have a products team, and they really focus on development of new resources, resources, guidance, doctrine, tools, and training for the education community. This team also manages our research and development portfolio, which focuses on a deeper understanding of the impact of emerging trends and issues on school environments and evaluating efficacy and efficiencies of current school safety strategies, tactics, and practices. We also have a partnership team that leads overall stakeholder engagement efforts within the very networks of stakeholders that focus on school safety, including those at the federal, state, and private sector levels. Next slide, please. So I want to spend a moment on that coordination of federal efforts. So our program coordinates uh, federal school safety efforts through the administration of the Federal School Safety Clearinghouse, which is an interagency uh, collaboration comprised of the U.S. Departments of Education, Health and Human Services, course, Homeland Security and Justice. As a part of these efforts, our program manages the Clearinghouse's public facing vehicle, which is schoolsafety.gov. That really serves as a comprehensive repository of federal and state resources, programs, and actionable recommendations on a range of school safety topics. Uh, the Clearinghouse Initiative provides a forum for a really um, comprehensive and whole of government approach that includes regular interagency review of content and best practices, as well as the curation and distribution of resources, guidance, and tools for school communities across the country. At the bottom of the slide here, you'll see um, the school safety issue areas that are encompassed by the clearinghouse and schoolsafety.gov. These focus areas really reflect the most pressing topics for the school community, including current and emerging trends or threats. Next slide, please. So this slide reflects um, key capabilities and features that have been built into schoolsafety.gov based on stakeholder feedback and engagement with school communities, particularly with those that are responsible for school safety on a day-to-day -day basis within our schools. Um, again, uh, these capabilities encompass not only the work of DHS, but of course of those clearinghouse agency partners that I mentioned before. Um, so we have nine core school safety topic pages, which I mentioned um, earlier, and those um, house the resources on those range of issues you just saw. We also have our Grants Finder tool, which is a new capability we launched last year that helps members of the K-12 community more easily find, apply for, and ultimately receive uh, school safety related funding. Our communication center provides a comprehensive collection of presentations, bulletins, and other materials available from schoolsafety.gov. 
We have a safety readiness tool, um, which assists users with evaluating their school safety's posture and generates a tailored action plan with options for consideration and related resources. We also have a state information sharing tool that provides streamlined and centralized location for accessing state specific school safety information. And then we have a resource library that serves as really that comprehensive repository of the range of school safety guidance, fact sheets, tools, and other information from across the federal government. Next slide. So I want to now focus on one of our other key resources um, for schools. So last February, we released the K-12 School Security Guide and accompanying suite of products, which are designed to provide K-12 districts and campuses with resources, tools, and strategies to improve school physical security. So the K-12 guide discusses what a layered system-based approach to school physical security entails and offers schools an overview of how vulnerability assessments, planning, and physical security should be implemented within their own settings. Uh, within that suite, we have our School Security Assessment Tool, or SSAT for short. It pairs with the guide, and it provides a web-based assessment tool for schools to identify how they, how they can incorporate policy planning or other physical security recommendations into their existing safety and security processes and plans. So in summary, this slide has a listing of the products in the suite, including the guide, the SSAT, and we've also just recently released um, aligned trainings that really help users understand how to use these products products. Um, the, the suite of products allow K-12 institutions to build school safety capacity to mitigate threats and risks relevant to their specific and unique, unique educational environments. And ultimately, what we hope for is that this product can help schools implement a systems-based approach to layer physical security without asking staff members to become security experts. So next slide. So this is our final slide and provides a snapshot of our key initiatives, many of which I've already spoken about, but I wanted to highlight a few others before closing out. Um, the National School Safety Summit. So our team hosts an annual national summit on K-12 school safety and security to bring federal, state, and local stakeholders together to share actual recommendations that enhance safe and supportive learning environments for our schools uh, through expert panels, keynote addresses, um, and um, other um, interviews with leaders in the field. The summit really aims to explore current issues in schools and consider research-informed strategies for those schools to apply. Our our inaugural summit was hosted in 2022 and really served as one of our more impactful and significant achievements last year. The event included participation from more than 7,800 individuals from all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Pivoting a bit to our outreach, public education, and conference participation, we conduct quite a bit of outreach to the academic community and to the very networks of stakeholders that focus on school safety. Because of those unique challenges and needs of school that I mentioned earlier, the broad range of stakeholders who make up the academic community is really vast and build, building and maintaining strong partnerships is really critical to our success. Some of our key external engagement activities include regular communications campaigns centered on timely and critical school safety topics, participation at national and state level conferences and events, a quarterly virtual training uh, hosted by the Clearinghouse, social media activity, and then direct outreach to and engagement with stakeholder groups and organizations that have equities to school safety. We leverage communication channels such as gut delivery, direct stakeholder outreach, and dedicated social media pages to bring greater awareness to school safety threats and align strategies and resources. And then product development, and you know, as I've mentioned, um, our program is focused on developing training and tools to support and enhance school safety and security efforts. Uh, resources are specifically designed to assist schools in strengthening their prevention, protection, and mitigation capabilities. So in addition to that K-12 guide product suite that I mentioned earlier, we are in the process of developing and deploying products tailored for schools related to bystander reporting and reporting toolkits. Um, the guidance on social media-based threats and responses, and then cybersecurity guidance tailored specifically for the K-12 community. So I want to thank everyone again for the opportunity to highlight uh, the School Safety Task Force and our work. I am now going to turn it over to our Deputy Associate Director for CISA Exercises, Mr. Patrick Stark. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Patrick Stark and the Deputy Associate Director for CISA Exercises. Talking about CISA exercises, 
We conduct cyber and physical security exercises with government, sector, and international partners to enhance the security and resilience of critical infrastructure. Exercises are one of the principal methods by which CISA identifies and validates areas for improvement in the security and resilience capabilities of federal, state, local, private sector, and international partners. Analysis and trends identified through exercises are critical to driving and shaping CISA's other risk reduction products, services, and resources. CISA Exercises is also responsible for administering the National Cyber Exercise Program established by 6 USC Section 665H and implementing the biennial National Cyber Exercise, also known as CyberStorm, required by Section 1744 of the FY21 National Defense Authorization Act. Next slide, Monique. Looking at our organization, we are organized around our mission. And again, that is to conduct cyber and infrastructure security exercises. So we have one branch for each of those with the program management office, which is responsible for our business functions and our exercise data analysis and reporting capabilities, which we'll speak to later in the presentation. Next slide, Monique. Talking about our functions, we have three principal service offerings. The first is end-to-end -end exercise planning and conduct services. Next is CISA Tabletop Ex Exercise Packages, or CTEPs, and third, National Exercises. Speaking to each one of these one by one, with regard to end-to-end -to -end exercise planning and conduct, this is our primary service offering. We use what's called the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, or HCEP methodology, to design, develop, conduct, and evaluate exercises upon request from various customers. These exercises can either be discussion-based, such as seminars, workshops, tabletop exercises and games, or operations-based, such as drills, functional exercises, all the way up to full-scale exercises, often with hundreds of participants, controllers, and actors. Scenarios include both physical security threats, such as active shooters, complex coordinated attacks, vehicle rammings, improvised explosive devices, civil unrest, and much more. Cybersecurity scenarios include cyber-induced cyber consequences, cyber-induced physical consequences, and physical-induced cyber consequences. In FY22, CISA exercises conducted 163 exercises with 14,260 participants. Our second service offering is CISA tabletop exercise packages. These are often referred to as exercises in a box and contain exercise scenarios, discussion questions, and templates that customers can download and tailor to their needs in running exercises of their own. There are nearly 100 CTEPs available on CISA.gov covering a range of scenarios for various sectors. Our third and final service offering is national exercises, including CyberStorm, the biennial national cyber exercise required by law, and Tabletop to Vote, our annual national election security exercise. CyberStorm 8 was conducted in March of 2022 and included more than 2,000 participants from more than 200 organizations and 13 international partners via the International Watch and Warning Network. CyberStorm 9 is scheduled for spring of 2024. Next slide, Monique. Exercise data analysis and reporting is a capability that CIS Exercises is currently building out and that we believe will be central to our role in helping to drive requirements for other CISA risk mitigating programs. Through this capability, we intend to conduct various meta-analysis of exercises across various stakeholder groups and threat vectors to distill common trends and recommendations, sorry, common trends in recommendations and findings and publish this analysis in readily accessible and easily digestible formats. The results are intended to not only inform future exercises, but also help other risk mitigating programs understand where our customers could benefit most from federal technical assistance programs. I certainly appreciate your time today and interest in CISA exercises. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague from the Office for Bombing Prevention, Mr. David Williamson. David. Thank you, Patrick. As Patrick said, I'm uh, David Williamson, uh, Deputy Associate Director for the Office for Bombing Prevention. And it's uh, my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, to talk to you a little bit about the office and its role in infrastructure security and uh, how it is we do what we do. Uh, the office was uh, formed a little over 15 years ago, uh, almost 16 years ago uh, now in the wake of a uh, series of uh, domestic and international terrorist attacks, uh, you know, featuring explosive devices uh, that uh, had a, a lot of impact 
uh, nationwide and really worldwide. Uh, so the office was born out in that type of environment. And since then, uh, we've become a, a uh, strong advocate in the counter IED area, both uh, in the interagency and governmental uh, circles, as well as with our private sector stakeholders. As you heard earlier from Mr. Harris, uh, the IED threat uh, is a enduring and global, th global threat. It continues to be a popular, uh, a popular tactic for terrorist organizations and for those malicious actors out there engaging in uh, targeted violence. So the office accomplishes its mission uh, through implementation of national uh, counter IED policy, as well as enhancing the nation's ability uh, to prevent, protect against, respond to, and mitigate um, bombing incidents or bomb threats. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, no briefing is complete without the uh, org chart. So this is what we look like uh, organ organizationally, how we're functionally aligned in order to accomplish that mission. And you'll see a common theme here as the uh, branches that you see listed here, uh, data analysis, technical assistance, training and strategy branch, uh, sort of aligned to our core functions or our core initiatives uh, that we undertake uh, to accomplish our, uh, our mission. Uh, so the office is arranged in those four, uh, four branches, uh, as well as uh, the front office and exec executive secretariat element uh, that uh, supports at the uh, subdivision level. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is kind of the meat, the core of what we do uh, here in our bombing prevention core functions. You know, as I said, we accomplish our mission through a portfolio of uh, complementary and focused counter IED capab capability uh, programs. Uh, we have a very robust training and awareness initiative or series of initiatives. Our training, our training programs are nationally accredited uh, programs through the International Association of Continuing Education and Training. And uh, we deliver that training uh, really daily uh, through a variety of uh, modalities. Uh, we have mobile training teams that travel around the country on a weekly basis, uh, delivering in-person training uh, tailored to specific stakeholder needs. Uh, we conduct in-person training uh, in resident at the uh, FEMA Center for Domestic Preparedness. And we, we do virtual instructor-led training on a uh, daily basis, uh, Tuesday through Thursday. Uh, three courses each day open to uh, stakeholders across the nation, as well as independent study trainings. Uh, those four categories kind of represent our key uh, key formal training initiatives. In addition to that, uh, we have a number of different uh, online how-to uh, short training videos that are topical in nature uh, to address any number of uh, counter IED activities, whether it be bomb threat or bomb searchers or that type of thing. The training awareness uh, activity is supported by a very robust uh, learning solutions and curriculum development uh, element that focuses on developing that uh, nationally accredited training that I spoke about, as well as de developing uh, stakeholder awareness products and job aids and guides, uh, you know, to help guide uh, both individuals and organizations uh, in their response to uh, bomb threats or bombing incidents. Uh, in addition to the training that we conduct, we also uh, operate a very uh, robust and popular train the trainer program called the Empowered Trainer Program uh, that's designed to build an enduring capability at uh, the state, local, tribal, territorial level, and even within our um, private sector partners to give them the ability to train OBP training courses to their stakeholders according to their schedules and their needs. Uh, so we certify uh, instructors within an organization that then go and 
uh, then deliver our training using our curriculum, our learning management systems, and, um, and all the support materials that they need to do that. The uh, next line of effort that I'd like to uh, speak with you about our core function is our information sharing. And sort of at the centerpiece of that is what we call our tripwire system, which is our technical resource for incident protection. And this is where we uh, we share incident information that uh, we collect, uh, analyze. Uh, we share that with our stakeholders and at a level that they can access it and provide them some meaningful information. Uh, so anyone with a Tripwire account uh, can go out and access um, any number of IED uh, reports or incident reporting uh, activities. We also, within the information sharing branch, also have a uh, interagency intelligence or information coordination uh, mission area there where we uh, embed uh, members of the OBP team into uh, uh, other counter IED information sharing uh, entities. Uh, for example, the uh, FBI C3 uh, activity down in Huntsville uh, to facilitate the flow of information between the two organizations, uh, as well as uh, uh, activities uh, like the National Explosive Task Force. Uh, so that we can uh, facilitate that transfer of information and uh, keep track of our IED incidents and the tactic techniques and procedures uh, that are being engaged. The uh, technical assistance and services uh, initiatives or line of effort is probably our most uh, diverse sort of uh, branch, if you will, or initiative area. It covers things uh, such as uh, counter IED capability assessments and planning, where we will we will actually go out and assess special response units that kind of have an IED nexus or an IED capability. So, for example, your bomb squads, uh, your explosive K9 teams, um, uh, SWAT teams that have. Uh, an EOD capability embedded in them or a counter IED capability embedded in them. Uh, so we we assess those capabilities. We also assess uh, jurisdictional uh, and state capabilities as well as organizational capabilities uh, as well. Uh, one of our newer uh, assessments really is our explosive blast modeling assessments, which will uh, provide an explosive blast model for a piece of criti uh, critical infrastructure or a special event uh, in order to aid planning and placement of protective measures uh, to support those types of events. Uh, so special event planning is what you see next there. Uh, we support a, a number of special events uh, every year uh, with a wide variety of OBP products and services that we deliver under what we call a techno technical assistance model, uh, whether it be uh, training or blast modeling, whatever that particular stakeholder needs in order to prepare them uh, for that particular event from a counter IED perspective. A uh, growth area for us as we continue to uh, build out our capabilities and service our stakeholders is what we call our counter IED technology uh, integration, uh, which is where we where we foster technology development and evaluating new technologies in order to fill capability gaps that we identify, uh, you know, through our capability assessments program and our other programmatic activities. Uh, so we try to uh, identify those gaps and then work with industry and research entities in order to address those gaps and uh, and find solutions and then facilitate the transfer of that solution uh, you know back to uh, that industry or or stakeholder group uh, voluntary explosive precursor chemical controls uh, the centerpiece uh, for this uh, Initiative or activity is our bomb making materials awareness program and our operational activity known as Operation Flashpoint. And this is where we actually have individuals that go out to point of sale retailers 
that sell products that contain uh, explosive precursor chemicals that can be used to manufacture homemade explosives or build IEDs to make them aware of the products that they're selling, increase their awareness and increase and and make them aware of suspicious purchasing activities or suspicious activities associated uh, with bomb making or bomb building and encouraging uh, reporting of those type of activities in order to prevent those types of attacks. And finally, in our policy coordination uh, initiative or line of area, you know, that's where we, uh, you know, work the policy piece. Primarily here, we're talking about implementation of Presidential Policy Directive 17 on countering IEDs, as well as its associated implementation plan and, uh, and the sub objectives and sub goals of that plan, uh, where we, we monitor that and we actually uh, lead or co-lead a number of those working groups associated with that implementation plan. We also co-chair the, uh, the Joint Program Office for Countering IEDs, uh, along with the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the implementation of and coordination of counter ID policy across all uh, intergovernmental agencies that have equities in the counter ID mission space. And within DHS, uh, we chair the uh, Department of Homeland Security IED Working Group uh, that uh, coordinates policy and program, uh, counter ID policy and program uh, implementation uh, within uh, within the department. Next slide, please. Uh, so this one is a little bit a uh, little bit busy, but just kind of a quick overview of all the uh, resources that I mentioned earlier. And uh, as uh, stated before, uh, you'll be getting more in-depth briefings on some of this uh, in the coming days. Um, but everything here from our training that I talked about earlier to our more in-depth services such as explosive blast modeling are represented here. One of the key aspects of OBP resources though is it's what we call a preparedness, prepa or it's a preparedness focus, right? So what we like to say is it's focused on left of boom and that is preparing people for that actual IED event. We do cover you know some some response and react and that type of thing but we don't get into uh you know investigation and and that piece of it so we're primarily preparedness side of the house all the products and services are predominantly uh free uh, which is always a bonus and they are scalable and tailorable uh, so for example the training or the capability analysis and the products themselves can be tailored to a particular stakeholder's needs. Next slide, please. Uh, here we see a few examples of our counter ID awareness and products. Uh, just to, to give you an example of what we're talking about in that category. Uh, and again, all scalable, tailorable, whether it's job age, checklists, awareness posters, cards, or our videos. Our videos are very popular. I encourage you to go out there and uh, you know, explore them a little bit and very versatile uh, as well, particularly uh, with uh, today's, uh, you know, today's population where they want information quick and they want it online. Uh, so we get uh, a lot of usage out of those uh, videos, about 60 to 70,000 uh, completions per year uh, there. And I believe I am almost out of time. Uh, so I will end it there and turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Ryan Donahy, the Associate Director for the Planning and Innovation Division. Ryan, over to you. Thank you so much, Dave. And thank you all so much for attending this afternoon. Um, like Dave said, my name is Ryan Donaghy, and I have the extreme pleasure of serving as the Acting Associate Director for ISD's newest subdivision, Planning and Innovation. We can go to the next slide. So one of our goals through sort of the development and stand up of the planning and innovation subdivision is to make sure that we are integrating um, and applying sort of innovative strategies across all of our work um, across the various subdivisions, as well as where we can applying sort of research and development solutions um, to tackle some of our, uh, you know, most pressing critical infrastructure security and resilience challenges. Um, we do this across a number of areas, including some policy topics um, that don't, you know, fit 
fit neatly um, into any of the other sort of subdivisions across ISD or across the broader agency. Um, so for example, uh, our subdivision works on a number of strategy and doctrine issues, um, including uh, the Presidential Policy Directive 21, the updates to that. Um, and also sort of the implementation of the bioeconomy executive order, um, which includes sort of looking through um, some of the unique challenges presented by biotechnology and biomanufacturing and how CISA as an agency, both from a physical security and from a cybersecurity posture, um, can lean in to sort of provide solutions to those challenges. Our subdivision also works um, on White House and interagency um, engagement sort of across uh, the various projects and portfolios that we work on. Um, and in addition to that engagement, we do extensive engagement across uh, state, local, tribal and territorial communities, academia and other sort of groups to make sure that we are working to understand a uh, common nomenclature um, as well as sort of a common understanding of what critical infrastructure data is. Um, we finally, um, where applicable and where we're able to sort of lean in, um, try to identify research and development solutions to some of the problems um, that we're either sort of seeing across our various subdivisions and our own, um, as well as sort of opportunities that we see across the broader agency space. Um, some of the other activities that we engage in in planning and innovation also include our um, requirements to make sure that we're doing appropriate strategic planning and review um, as a CFO Act agency here at DHS. Um, we can go to the next slide. And we'll give you a little bit more information about all of the sort of structures that sit under our um, required org chart uh, slide. So on the far left, our integrated planning branch really focuses on a lot of that White House um, and interagency engagement across sort of the policy space. This includes sort of working through and understanding how best to implement the requirements of this as a strategic plan, um, as well as sort of leaning into some of these policy spaces, again, sort of similar to the previous slide, that don't quite have sort of a, a neat home yet um, and that the integrated planning branch can sort of leverage their skill sets um, to make sure that we're sort of identifying what space ISD really occupies in that sort of policy or strategy. Um, some of the other sort of efforts include sort of the implementation of our annual operating plan, um, as well as sort of the important sort of performance management operations that really sort of sit within um, the infrastructure security division space. Our program analyst and information services also sort of captures that performance management element, as well as sort of broader coordination around our information services to make sure that we're really executing on um, the types of goals and innovative strategies that we'd like to sort of make sure we're implementing moving forward. Um, and finally, our innovation branch is set up under sort of two um, sections, really, the mission assurance team and then the requirements development execution and transition team. Um, the mission assurance team is responsible for implementing and making uh, associated updates to our infrastructure data taxonomy. Um, the infrastructure data taxonomy, um, I think the version four was originally designed and implemented in 2011. Um, and I think we all know that a number of of sort of changes have taken place over the past 11 years um, and we have a team hard at work to sort of making sure that that our sort of you know data dictionary for critical infrastructure um, is really keeping pace with some of those changes especially in terms of sort of the interconnected risk that we see sort of on um, an analytics side so they're doing really incredible work there. They're also working across the critical infrastructure community to make sure that um, we're able to sort of effectively articulate and provide assistance and service where applicable um, to help people sort of understand and develop their own capabilities um, in terms of sort of managing and governing critical infrastructure data. At the same time, we recognize that there are a number of states and localities um, that have really excellent critical infrastructure data, and we're looking at ways to actively partner to make sure that we understand um, how people are sort of conceptualizing their authoritative sources for critical infrastructure information. And the requirements development execution and transition team um, is working really hard to sort of, as noted on the earlier slide, um, provide research and development as well as technology solutions um, when there are sort of integrated problems either across all of the subdivisions um, or across the broader agency where an R&D solution might be applicable. Um, they also look at opportunities where um, there might be ways to innovate policy, sort of working alongside the integrated planning branch um, to make sure that we're doing sort of complementary policy improvements, as well as making sure that we're having R&D and technology improvements where we need to. 
Um, we are going to go into a deeper dive on the planning and innovation subdivision later this week, so I invite you all to sort of attend that session. Um, but I, at this time, am going to hand it over to Mr. Craig Conklin, who's going to give you more information about the infrastructure assessments and analysis subdivision. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. As Ryan said, my name is Craig Conklin, and I am the Associate Director for Infrastructure Assessments and Analysis within ISD. If you can go to the next slide, please. Our focus is to really provide critical infrastructure owners and operators and stakeholders across the nation with the ability to make risk informed decisions on how to improve their security and their resilience. Next slide, please. Here is our organization chart, and as you can see, we are uh, aligned with four branches that really mirror the four focus areas that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Our resilient services branch, which deals with the assessments and analysis of critical infrastructure and the provision of methodologies and tools and frameworks for tackling resilience decisions and assessments decisions on how to improve uh, security and resilience. Uh, the second branch, our information protection and sharing branch, deals with the collection, sharing, and protection of what we call protected critical infrastructure information. This is information provided by owners and operators about their facilities that they do not want to get in the hands of folks that could then use it for nefarious purposes. The third branch there is the mission systems branch, and this is basically our information technology area, our CISA gateway and our PCII management system, as well as a whole bunch of other capabilities, which I'll describe in a few in a few minutes. And then the last branch on the right is our program training branch, and our focus there is to provide training to CISA's employees, especially those in the field, such as the protective security advisors, and give them the knowledge, skills, abilities, and tools that they need to accomplish their mission in the field. Next slide, please. Here are our four IA functions. Uh, first off, uh, assessing and planning. Uh, what we want to do here is to develop the methodologies and tools for conducting the wide variety of surveys and assessments that we do conduct, and I'll talk about those in great detail on the next slide. Uh, we also provide technical assistance to the users of those tools and to other federal, state, local, tribal, territorial officials on how to build in resilience and build in security as they uh, look at improving their critical infrastructure. Going to the right there, inform. Again, this is where we have our PCI program and, and where we collect, share, and protect the information that is provided to us. Uh, we want to make sure that it is not um, eligible to be FOIA'd, if you will. It's not eligible to use for regulatory or statutory purposes and doesn't get involved in um, or shared with folks that should not have access to it. Uh, just below that, we have our training, and again, this is training of people and uh, protective security advisors, folks in the field, um, in order to do their job and accomplish the system mission. And then lastly, on the left there, technolo technologize. Um, basically, what we want to do is use information technology and to uh, build tools that can really utilize that capability in the field to make the jobs of the PSAs, for example, easier and to provide a quality um, methodology and a capability to store information, retrieve the information, and then be able to analyze that information as needed to accomplish the mission. Next slide, please. This is a very busy slide, but it gives a real good, clear indication of our assessment portfolio. If you look at the left there, the SAFE, the Security Assessment at First Entry Tool, that is used for those kinds of facilities that have very little or no security protocol and the folks have very little experience with security measures. It's this kind of um, assessment is done by the protective security advisors in coordination with the owners and operators of the facility. 
just to the right of that, you have our infrastructure survey tool, which is used on facilities that have a more robust security presence. This might be like a hospital or an industrial facility uh, or something like that. And again, this is done by the protective security advisors with the owners and operators. And through this assessment, we provide uh, the owner operator with a dashboard and, and options for improving their security or resilience. Just to the right of that, we have a multi asset and system assessment capability. And this is where we look at a system of facilities. A good example of that would be a hospital system whereby you might have a central hospital and, and several outlying clinics or facilities or outpatient capabilities. We look at that um, to identify what the vulnerabilities are to the various facilities within that system, identify which ones need most attention, identify the threats, and again, provide options for the owner to uh, look at to determine where they might want to make their investments for enhancing security and, and enhancing resilience. And then on the far right, we have our RRAP, which, are, which is our regional assessment program. This is where we work with federal, state, local, tribal, territorial partners to address issues on a regional level that they may not have the capability to analyze and to address. These are up to three years in length and involve a, a lot of interaction between those federal, state, local, tribal, territory officials, as well as the critical infrastructure owners and operators to really delve into what the issue is and then identify options for addressing those particular issues. It's a very extensive um, assessment process and, uh, and a typical RM could involve up to 20 or 30 different partners and stakeholders. And I've seen RMs that have actually involved up to almost 100 different organizations, very detailed. So what you see is that we have a, a, a wide range of assessment capabilities going from the less complex safe kind of uh, assessments to the RMs, which are much more complex. Just below those, we do have the infrastructure visualization platform which is an imagery capture and multimedia presentation. What we do is we work with the infrastructure owner and operator to capture data about their facility. Uh, we build in the, the, the floor plans and the diagrams of their facility. Work. We look at the dependencies and interdependencies of that facility with supporting infrastructure, and we provide them a product that can be used for planning purposes, whether it's planning for emergencies or or uh, a, or other events or even for planned events and things like that. It's a very complex tool um, using a lot of 360 degree camera activity as well. So that is sort of our suite of assessment activities that we have uh, going on. Next slide, please. For planning uh, purposes, we have developed guidance in the infrastructure resilience planning framework. We use this resource to help frame the process and, and it also offers resources to SLTT officials as they go about developing the planning for their community so that they can build in resilience up front. Um, supporting that is the infrastructure dependency primer. Um, which helps them better understand the dependencies that can impact risk and resilience in their particular community. Um, basically, we provide a lot of examples on how to assess these interdependencies, identify what they are, and how they can impact your, um, your particular area. We've also produced a drought guide for local uh, uh, officials which provides a quick reference on how um, droughts and how their forecast can affect operations and provides some guidance on mitigating um, those impacts and, and some planning resources on how to plan your activities so that you can um, prepare for a drought. Next slide, please. Again, some more um, planning guidance. This is the Port Resilience Guide. We've developed a tool in coordination with the Corps of Engineers um, on how to assess port facilities and the supporting infrastructure. 
Um, last time I checked, there were approximately 587 ports in the United States. Um, a lot of different definitions for what a port is and and and, and their significance, but there's is quite a bit of activity out quite a bit of activity out there with those ports. So we felt working with the Corps of Engineers it would be a good idea to develop this particular guide. Uh, next slide, please. On the information protection side, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we collect, protect, and share information um, from the critical infrastructure owners and operators. As part of our partnership with them, we want to make sure that they feel comfortable in sharing this critical information with us. So as part of the Critical Infrastructure Act, Information Act of 2002, which was part of the Homeland Security Act, um, we actually encourage the sharing of this information. We can legally protect it from submission um, uh, from and protect it from FOIA laws, uh, sunshine laws and the like. That way the owners and operators feel comfortable giving us the information so that we can actually use it for their benefit and for our benefit. Um, as the slide shows there, we, we've got over four and a half thousand authorized users and um, 81 accredited uh, entities across all 50 states and, and numerous federal uh, governments. Very important program um, and uh, is actively involved in such activities as working with the NFL for this week's um, NFL um, draft activities. In fact, we were talking to folks today, the um, a lot of activity with the NFL on the Super Bowl as well as the um, upcoming draft. Next slide. With regard to the use of the information technology, these next three slides will highlight some of the core tools and capabilities that we have within our CISA gateway. Uh, on the survey and assessment side, we store a lot of that survey information on the gateway and use it to develop dashboards and conduct analysis and develop trends and provide information back to the owners and operators for them to use in making risk informed decisions. We have a dependency and cascading impact analysis capability which can show how impacts by natural events or terrorist attack affect, affect a particular infrastructure and identifies those dependencies that we are uh, concerned about. Uh, the dashboard mentioned there in the bottom right gives the ability for owners and operators to actually play with infrastructure enhancements and see what kind of return on investment they get and, and how much their either their security index improves or their resilience index. Next slide, please. We house our PCI management system on the gateway. Uh, this is where we have access and control uh, training for the authorized users. It can actually protect the information, validate it, and then disseminate it appropriately where, so that it's used properly. Another tool I'd like to highlight is the CEDIT tool, the Special Events and Domestic Incidents tool. That tool is uh, used to plan for, respond to, and manage special events and domestic incidents. Next slide, please. This is our last slide, and here we talk about our digital gateway and our map view. Basically, um, robust geospatial data viewers, which really allow us to visualize the data and look at the critical infrastructure in that manner. Um, a very important tool. This is our last slide, so this really concludes the IAA presentation. And if you'd like more detail about our ac assessment activities in particular, please join me tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. for the I uh, IAA breakout session. It also include, concludes ISD's presentations, and we really appreciate you attending our sessions. And now I have the pleasure to turn the microphone over to David Patrick. David, over to you. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for uh, participating in today's event. It was, a, it was a great event. I know it's a bit of a fire hose for folks with all the stuff that uh, ISD is doing. My hope here is that with understanding all the work that's going into what CISA and particularly the infrastructure security mission is doing, that you get a better understanding as industry of how you can help us and how you can support us in the future. 
I think a, a little of this was about myth busting on some of the things that uh, I know I get asked all the time. Uh, we have questions about, can we sell you hardware and things like that? We don't do a whole lot of hardware. We have a lot of advisory and support services. We have a lot of training and exercises and assessments and analytic tools and products and, and uh, policy process and documentation and materials and, and things like that that go into the various mission sets that we have. And we hope that giving you an understanding of the various things that we do here, uh, particularly in this area, infrastructure security, gives you an understanding of how you can better support those. I want to thank the ISD team for all of their work and, of course, uh, all of the stuff that they're going to do the rest of the week and providing you an overview and more information about uh, what they do in more in-depth uh, and question and answer sessions throughout the rest of the week. And with that, I, I do want to turn it back over to Steve Harris, uh, The Dead. I love that title. Uh, for any closing remarks he may have. Thank you, David. And again, let me just thank your team for uh, partnering with us to put this together. And again, looking forward to the engagement we can have with all of you that uh, joined us here today. I hope you all found this informative. I am looking forward to seeing some of the questions that come about. And I think, you know, the sessions that we've got today and the following day are going to be very interesting and uh, again, stir a, a good discussion and dialogue. And that's a key part of this. It's that uh, partnership and relationship that we want to keep going uh, again so that you can help us with this uh, ever so critical mission to uh, uh, protecting the American way of life. With that, let me go back to uh, Monique. Thank you, um, and thank you everyone for participating in Citizens Industry Day. We have, uh, we hope you found today's presentations informative. As always, vendors are encouraged to monitor the DHS Acquisition Planning Forecast System, APFS, which provides high-level information regarding CISA's upcoming competitor requirements. That said, it should be noted that CISA continues to update APFS throughout the year as new requirements emerge. So it will be beneficial for industry to continue to monitor a site during the entire year. Please send APFS inquiries via email to apfs inquiries queries at sista.dhs.gov. Uh, looking into the rest of FY23, uh, please check out Doing Business with Sista at um, https uh, www.sista.gov, Doing Business with Sista, for more information regarding additional upcoming virtual industry days. Also, industry engagement team will host several 30-minute weekly vendor-focused sessions for specific capabilities to ensure Sista staff have a chance to learn more about the innovative work being done in the wider market. You may contact the uh, industry engagement team at Sista vendor engagement at sista.dhs.gov. And please join us tomorrow on Wednesday 26th and on Thursday 27th for the breakout sessions presented by ISD subject matter experts, uh, where they will present these top topics that are on the screen and answer your questions. And again, thank you so much for attending today's Industry Day event. This concludes today's main event session. We hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>